Last week, I began a five-week series on something that Anglicans call the five marks of mission. And here we go. We'll see if we can get them up. These are the Anglican five marks of mission. I talked about this. They were developed at the same time that people were talking about what the church's mission is and were saying that all the church has to do is evangelise people and worry about personal salvation. And the Anglican Church says there is more to mission than it's hard. <laughs> There's more to mission than just someone standing on a preach a, on a street corner waving a placard. There's more to mission. So the Anglicans got together and they put together a committee because it's not an Anglican outcome unless there's a committee formed to discuss. They got a committee from people all over the world and they said, what is mission? And these are the five things they came up with. To proclaim the good news of the kingdom, to teach, baptise and nurture new believers, to respond to human need by loving service, to transform unjust structures of society, to challenge violence of every kind and to pursue peace and reconciliation. And five, to strive to safeguard the integrity of creation and sustain and renew the life on earth. The breath at this point... These are hefty things to talk about and incredibly inspiring. Now, I've spent years studying theology, which is when people ask big questions about God and argue about the answers. That's generally how theology goes. But one branch of theology that I quite like is called ecclesiology, which is the study of the church. And again, people say, what is the church? And then for 2,000 years have argued about the answer. How do you know what the church is? But the one thing that uh, people talk about when they talk about the church is the nature of the church is given by God and we're called to, to be, to grow into it, to express it. And I think here is a nice statement that captures a lot about this is the nature of the church. This is what the church does when it's being all that God has called it to be and all we're called to do is to grow into this to be who we've been called to be. And so last week I talked about what is the kingdom of God. It's a phrase we hear thrown about a lot, but what exactly is it? And if you missed that, you can go online and have a listen. Or you can Google, do some research. What is the kingdom of God? But this captures Jesus' love for those on the margins. The poor, the sick, the vulnerable, the oppressed. God loves them. And so we are called to, as followers of Jesus, to love all that he loves. Now I'm trying to, trying to sound cogent and coherent, but my, my notes are just in this really random order here. So I'm just going to probably just pause for a moment. You can ponder that deep thought while I pull myself together. I remember doing this once in a church I grew up and I preached and the person afterwards says, Carolyn is the only person I know who could also make a mess of her notes. Because they knew that I had a desk that you could barely see the bottom of. Anyway, here we go. So today we're actually talking about to teach, baptise and nurture new believers. And this is one of the core elements Jesus told his followers, that this is what they were to do. And here's the words of Jesus so Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So this is pretty critical this is, you know, Jesus' parting words to his followers. What is it you need to do now? You know, what is the final instruction? Here it is. Teach. Baptize. Let people know about God. There's an incredible story in the book of Acts that kind of catches this. And I want to read it to you. It's one of my favorites. I think I must have had it as a children's book when I was growing up. But here is this like impulse in the early church as they live this out. And this is the story of one of Jesus' disciples, Philip, and him meeting an Ethiopian eunuch. As for Philip, an angel of the Lord said to him, Go south down the desert road that runs from Jerusalem to Gaza. 
So he started out and he met the treasurer of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Kandaki, the queen of Ethiopia. The eunuch had gone to Jerusalem to worship and he was now returning. Seated in his carriage, he was reading aloud from the book of the prophet Isaiah. And the Holy Spirit said to Philip, go over and walk along beside the carriage. So Philip ran over and heard the man reading from the prophet Isaiah. And Philip asked, do you understand what you're reading? And the man replied, how can I, unless someone instructs me? And he urged Philip to come up into the carriage and sit with him. And the passage of scripture he had been reading was this. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. He was humiliated and received no justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. And the eunuch asked Philip, tell me, was the prophet talking about himself or someone else? So beginning with the same scripture, Philip told him the good news about Jesus. As they rode along, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, there's some water. Why can't I be baptized? Then he ordered the carriage to stop. And they went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. Here's this incredible story. This is the beginning of the church, where they discover there are people who have deep spiritual yearning and questions. They're wrestling. Who is God? What does this mean? I don't understand it. And the disciples, here we can see, are following what Jesus has taught them, to teach, to nurture, to baptize. What I love about this story is traditionally religions were quite ethnically bound. If you belong to a certain ethnic group, that was your religion. It was all sort of bound up. And for Jews, it was the same. You were a Jew if you were ethnically Jewish. You were allowed to be considered one of the people of God if you had the right mother. Um, and so here is this kind of understanding that people had had for centuries. This is what it means to be the people of God. But here, here is this new kingdom. Here's this new community. Here's a new culture emerging. And when the early church baptized people, people became Christians as a symbol of belonging to community. They were baptized. They would say these words that are found in the book of Galatians, in Christ There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. And here it is, an Ethiopian eunuch, which traditionally is someone that, you know, for Jewish people would have been considered definitely outsider for all manner of reasons. And here is this new community of Jesus. All are welcome. Come and be part of this family. And so then, this is the task of the disciples. This is the task of the church. So how do we wrestle with this teaching side of things? You know, for a long time now, the church has kind of wondered, how do you pass the faith on to children? Because in the past, you know, children just did what their parents said. (laughs) Ho-ho. You know, like in terms of you didn't really stray too far from your parents' belief. So in the early church... You know, your kids would be Christian, you'd raise them up, their kids would be Christian, and so on. And then that spread through Europe, through um, an era called Christendom. And then all of a sudden, we've come to the end of an era, and people are now like, how on earth do you actually pass faith on? How do you talk about what you believe? And there's actually been this big vacuum. People are suddenly like, I actually don't even know what I believe, really. I wouldn't actually be able to string together a coherent sentence about what the Bible is, what it means, who God is. And so, just as a refresher, recap, what on earth is the Bible? What are we meant to be teaching people? If this is what the church is called into, what does it actually mean? So we've got a um, video clip here. collection of ancient documents written between two and three thousand years ago, all manner of 
kinds of documents. But I think it's most helpful to think of it as a story, one single overarching story. That's, that's one of the miracles of it, if you like, one of the amazing things about it, is that written over a long period of time, it can be, it can be seen and read as a single story of human beings and God in the world. And right at the center of that story is Jesus of Nazareth. And so we've got everything that leads up to him and everything that flows on from him afterwards. Um, it's got lots of laws, proverbs, songs, um, accounts of kings' reigns, all manner of things, and instructions for people. But it's not primarily either a law book or an instruction book or a wise book of you know, comfortable sayings to think about. It's primarily a story, and all those other things find their place in the story. The Bible works best, I think, if we read it as a story and fit all the other kinds of texts into that. This year we're remembering the end of the First World War and lots of stories are being told. Some of them are official national stories, if you like. Others are family stories or regional stories, individual stories. And as a nation, sometimes we feel this is who we were becoming. This tells us something about our past and who we are now. And I think just in the same way, we read the Bible to understand who we are in relation to God and the world not so that we repeat all the things that happened there. In fact, if you think about the First World War, we definitely don't want to repeat the disasters of Gallipoli or the Battle of the Somme. But we do want to learn who we were becoming so that we know who we are, so that we know how to act in relationship to God and to each other and to the world in which God has placed us. Uh, and so we read it like that, not for, not firstly for laws and instructions. It's not primarily an instruction book on how to live. It's a story of how people live with God, and we have to extrapolate from that in our own situation to understand how God wants us to live here and now. The Bible is different from, from other writings because of this sense of God, God's involvement with it. God was involved in the beginning, God was involved in the lives of the human people who lived those stories, God was involved in the lives of the authors who wrote messages to people, and God is involved in our lives and able to take these words which were written so long ago about some other time, some other place, some other people, and make them suddenly real and relevant to us. Not that we read them just straight off the page, but that we read them in our walk with God, and God speaks to us through them. So it's a little bit of a recap. What is the Bible? What is it? And it's this reminder we're invited to be part of a story that's been going on for thousands of years. The creator of the universe longs to be in relationship with humans, longs for us to know him, longs for us to know that we are loved more than we can ever imagine, that we are cared for, that God knows our story and is with us. And so here is a reminder that when we go to the Bible, this is what we can find. This dance with the creator of the universe, who is interested in us, who cares about us. And a long time ago, one of the psalmists wrote these words reflecting on their relationship with scripture. He wrote, how sweet your words taste to me. They are sweeter than honey. Your commandments give me understanding. No wonder I hate every false way of life. Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. And as that video clip said, when you read scripture, it's not to have a hammer come and beat you. You know, this is how you're meant to be living. You're not good enough. It's a light. It's like honey. It's an invitation. The decisions before you now, the questions you have, there's answers if you go on this journey. They might not always be the answers we want or imagine, but God is there and God is with us. So as I was pondering this, 
This week, I've been hearing stories from families who talk about how it is that they engage with reading the Bible. How do they understand, you know, what it is that we're being called into? And I want to share with you a couple of uh, the ways that I've heard that people are engaging with Scripture, because I think this is the challenge. It's raining outside, isn't it? The planting's over. Come on back in. (laughs) Um, You know, there is some work required. And I think sometimes we think, oh, you know, turning up to church once every third week on a Sunday, tick. That'll help me, you know, connect with God. But actually, there's kind of some work required on our part. How do we engage with God? How do we find our connection with God? So I'm going to share with you two things that I've heard people doing. And the first one, this is the Lednall family who are on holiday at the moment, about to hop on a plane. But some of you, I'm seeing some nods. People are like, I've heard of this one. Lectio 365. This is an app. So I've put that picture up. This is how you can install the app. Now there's Lectio 365 and there's Lectio for families. And that's particularly for younger kids. But what it is, is a beautiful voice who will read to you scripture and then ask you questions so you can ponder on it and reflect. So the Lednall family have been doing the grown-ups version with their kids ever since they're little, and their youngest kid in particular finds it hard now to go to sleep without hearing this beautiful voice reading scripture to her and helping her to relax into hearing, you know, the story of God, finding ourselves in connection to God. Now I've got another video clip, um, and it's the person, it's from uh, the group that has put together this app. They also run a course called the Lectio course. But as they talk about this course, you'll get a little bit of a sense. What is Lectio 365? Where has it come from? Um, Is it for you? Is this something you want to download as you um, go today? So I'm going to show you. Here we go. This video clip. Over the next five sessions, we're going to grow and go deeper in our ability to hear God's voice using a powerful, ancient form of prayer called Lectio Divina. This is an approach to scripture that emphasizes reading it prayerfully, slowly, and with imagination. It becomes exciting, surprising, challenging, moving. The Bible comes to life. We create space for God to speak to our hearts as well as our heads. His desire is not just to speak to us, but also increasingly to speak through us. We begin to become God's word for a world that may never read the Bible. Lectio is this moment where I have a personal encounter with Christ. Nice. Guaranteed. <laughs> okay, this is extraordinary. I have been arrested for 32 months in metal shipping container because of my faith. If you think about how Jesus taught, he used symbolism and metaphor through parables to bypass our logic and, and really get into our heart. As you walk with God, you start to get familiar with His way of communicating to you. Something you might want to Google, you might be really inspired by that and go, I'm going to grab two or three people, we're going to do this course together, five weeks, find out a bit more or that might make you intrigued enough to go have a look at the app. So it's one of the practices that one of our families from church here are doing. And just on Friday, I heard about another one that I'd never heard of before. And um, this is the Harima Fano. They do something they've just started called imaginative prayer. Now, I was chatting to Dallas, and he said, at first I thought my kids wouldn't be into it at all. Would they be able to be still and quiet? But he said it's been incredible. They engage, they answer the questions, they're interested. And so I am going to finish this morning, and we are together going to do imaginative prayer, one of the prayers 
from this. Now, it's designed for children, but I found it quite profound. This too is based on an ancient way of praying and praying through scripture. So let's just have a moment where we pause and we're quiet. Close your eyes and let's take a few deep breaths together. God, I pray that you will release our imagination to help us to hear you speak to us during this time together. We open our hands to you. We open our ears to you. Come, Holy Spirit. Close your eyes and imagine that you see two hands knitting. Imagine there are two hands in front of you with a great ball of wool sitting next to those hands. What colour is the wool? Is it all one colour or is it different colours? If you were to knit something special, what colour wool would you choose? Watch as the hands begin to shape the wool into something. The wool loops around the knitting needles and first begins to form a shape that you recognise. You aren't exactly sure what it is yet, but you have the sense that the person knitting is taking great care and paying attention to every detail. The hands you see in front of you are strong hands, but they gently hook and loop the wool so carefully You notice now that you begin to see a set of feet being formed. They are perfect feet. And they seem about the same size as your feet. Suddenly you notice that these feet are no longer made of wool. They seem to be real live feet. And yet the hands continue to knit more. This is very strange indeed. But wait, it gets even stranger. It isn't just that these feet look like your feet, they are your feet. You can tell by looking at them. You know your own feet when you see them, and those are definitely your feet. What do your feet look like? Try and notice what you see. Watch as the knitted legs turn into real legs. Your legs are right there, connected to your feet. Someone is knitting with great detail and care and everything they are knitting is coming to life. Watch as your body is knit together and formed. Your arms, your hands, your fingers. Imagine the hands are knitting, that are knitting. Pause for a moment and reach out and grab one of your hands. Are you wondering who this is? Who is knitting you and forming you from the ground up? Let's continue to look closely. Watch as these hands knit your neck and begin working on your chin. Nobody's chin is like anyone else's. You have a unique chin. Next, your lips. Your nose. Your cheeks. Your ears. And finally, your eyes. Imagine now that your whole body is almost formed and someone is knitting your eyes into place. Suddenly you can see. You see the hands that are knitting you. You see the wool lying next to you. You blink. And then you open your eyes to see the hands are the hands of Jesus. They are bringing you into existence, bringing you into life. He knits and you are created. Think for a moment about who you are, who God has made you to be. What do you notice about yourself? What are you good at? What makes you laugh? What makes you cry? When do you feel strong and confident? 
productivity makes you feel like you're doing something you were meant to do? When do you feel weak and maybe a little bit insecure? Are there things that you try to do that are hard for you? God has knit you together to be just the way you are. Can you think of anything that makes you uniquely you? Listen to these words of the psalmist David, who wrote many psalms. He says, Oh yes, you shaped me first inside, and then you knit me together in my mother's womb. I thank you, God, you are breathtaking, body and soul. I am marvellously made. I worship in adoration. What a creation. You know me inside and out. You know every bone in my body. You know exactly how I was made bit by bit, how I was sculpted from nothing into something. Like an open book, you watched me grow from conception to birth. All the stages of my life were spread out before you. The days of my life all prepared before I'd even lived one day. Of all the things that God loves in the world, the most important thing to pay attention to is that God loves you. The most important part of the story is that God loves so many things and that he loves you in particular. Of all the things that God loves, what is the most important thing to you? That he loves me. God, call us and draw us into a relationship with you. Teach us so that out of our own lives we may teach others. Show us how we can connect to your story. And God, I pray particularly in this week, may we all get a sense or an idea of how we can connect to you whether it's through Lectio 365, whether it's through imaginative prayer. But God, you know how we're going to connect best to you. And I pray that we would come across ideas and rhythms and practices that are going to help us to know you, to know your story, and to find ourselves in your story. Amen.